Thank you, Rich. Welcome to the booth here at Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad. That is Randy Bueller. That is Luis Scott Vargas. And I am Marshall Sutcliffe. And we are excited to bring you the finals. Andrea Mangucci versus Steve Rubin. Let's go down right now. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas and Randy Bueller. I've got a pair of Hall of Famers with me to guide us through the finals. We've got Andrea Mangucci from Italy. Take a look at Andrea. He's playing Bant Company, the deck that I think a lot of people were aiming for coming into the tournament. And here it is in the finals, even though it didn't have a great performance in the, uh, in the Swiss portion of the tournament. Big smile there from Andrea. Let's look at his opponent now, Steve Rubin from the United States. He's playing green-white tokens from Team Face-to-Face -face Games there. And it looks like the players are having a friendly chat, but it's about to get gruesome down here as the play gets underway in our best out of five finals. Of course, we're going to be playing two games, no sideboards, and then any games after that will have a sideboard. Uh, what do you guys make of the matchups, Luis? Have you seen anything jump out to you here in the early stages? Uh, mostly it's that I think once we look at all the numbers afterwards, this deck that Team Face to Face has built is going to be the most dominant deck in the tournament. I think if you look at all the players who played it and what their all their win rates were, and based on that information and w what I've seen so far, I, I have to imagine they think their band company matchup is good. Just it's hard to bring a deck with a bad band company matchup. Randy, do you have a sense for have they any of the matchups that they've seen uh, throughout the rest of the tournament here? Yeah, I believe uh, Steve beat this beat Band Company once. In the Swiss of the tournament, I don't think Andrea was paired against the green-white tokens. Yeah, that's correct. I, I got to agree with Luis, by the way, and hats off to the face-to-face -to -game, face -face games guys. They basically broke it two Pro Tours in a row. They put together the Eldrazi deck at the last Pro Tour that put, what, three of you guys into the top eight, right? Yeah. And now here, their green-white tokens deck. Steve got in. They had another one lose playing for top eight in the last round. They had a tremendous win percentage with this deck. Yeah, imagine getting a chance to test with that team, huh? <laughs> <laughs> ah, that Eldrazi deck was great. All right, so it looks like Duskwatch Recruiter, another breakout card here at this tournament, is going to attack from Andrea Mangucci. And it's going to get actually a chump block by that uh, plant token from Steve Rubin. He's got a Thraben Inspector sitting there. And Andrea Mangucci just going to run out the tireless tracker. I think that's the first turn three tireless tracker I've seen all weekend. Generally speaking, they come out on turn four. Yeah, against removal heavy decks, you're going to want to play it and play a land immediately. But yeah, Steve doesn't have a ton of removal here, so. He, he, he's By not a ton, you mean he has a single copy of Stasis Snare? Well, he's got four Jamokas. He's got a Jamokas. Yeah, right. and, and, and one in his hand as well, but no good. But he And he could have played Command here, but I think just gumming up the board with his Planeswalkers. I mean, this is their win condition. This is how they, they defeat the other creature-based decks. Now, what does Andrea have to try to combat that? Well, he can try to collect a company. He has one in his hand. He can, like, you know, flood the board with creatures. Reflector Mage obviously offers some swings as well, but... The, the band company deck is, doesn't, you know, doesn't have any burn spells, doesn't have tons of removal. Again, just Dromoka's command mostly. So against a, an ever-increasing board of inspectors, plants, and knights, uh, it, it's going to be difficult for Andrea to really threaten these planeswalkers. That's got to be a collected company. <laughs> yep, it sure is. And he's going to hit two cards off of it, a Duskwatch Recruiter and a Bounding Krasis. So... Andrea Mangucci doing it the good old-fashioned way with, with actual creatures while Steve Rubin builds up tokens. And it looks like Gideon is under assault here. Yeah, but there's no way that either Planeswalker is going to, you know, die here. Like, the plant token is going to jump in front of the tracker, and then Duskwatch Recruiter knocks Gideon to two. No big deal. And now, basically how Planeswalkers tend to work is every time you activate them, you're going to get a pretty decent advantage. And the fact that Steve goes, turn three, Planeswalker, activate. Turn four, Planeswalker activate, activate, turn five, activate, activate. Like, he, he's, he's getting ahead, even though Andrea has a perfectly fine draw. Two drop, three drop, company into two creatures is you know, kind of what you're looking for. But Steve is not costing himself any cards to, to get benefits here, and especially when you start wow. you know, using Nissa's ability. I think the tireless tracker has uh, <laughs> tracked its last clue here. You're going to see that Dromica's command now from Ruben. 
Yeah, and Steve actually is kind of flooded. He, he, he has, you know, just three more lands in hand. Like, if he had another play like a hanger back this turn, it would have been even better for him. But he still has, you know, two three threes and a three four against uh, Andrea's two two twos and a three three. So, plus the two planeswalkers. Yeah, see, Ruben looks like he's out to an early lead here over Andrea Mangucci, but it is Andrea's turn. I like stacking up the, the counters on the Thraben Inspector as well because Reflector Mage bouncing Thraben Inspector is pretty good for Steve. He, he gets to replay it and get, get a clue back. Mangucci going over his options here. This is Mangucci's second Pro Tour Top 8. It's Steve's first. All right, and a nice sequence here for him as well. He's going to play two cards in one turn, a Jace and a Reflector Mage. Reflector Mage is going to take out a token. Yeah, Oath of Nyssa, again, giving, see, this is, this is why Oath of Nyssa is good. We saw Steve in the final game against Seth Manfield, Oath into a land, and now here he draws Oath of Nyssa, and he can hit, looks like another copy of Nyssa herself. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what he hit. It is kind of funny. Steve wishes he could, like, play the second Nyssa, make a plant, then minus the first Nyssa, but he has to, because of the legend rule, he has to play, he has to use the first Nyssa's ability if he wants to, and the, the obvious answer would be to make a knight with Gideon, minus Nyssa down to one, then play a new Nyssa, and either minus it or make a plant. It's possible that Steve could just make a plant here with Nyssa, but it's kind of hard to resist minusing and then, and then making a, a second Nyssa. It looks like that's exactly what he's going to do, Luis, so Plus one, plus one counters abound here. And now he's going to cast the second copy of Nyssa. Oath of Nyssa doing good work, letting him tap three planes for this. Keep up a potential Dromokos command, though I don't think he actually has one. One problem for Steve, though, is that Andrea's got access to so many more cards. He's got a clue token sitting in play. He also has a JC he can start activating. And once he hits two more cards in Graveyard, he's going to be able to flashback Collected Company. He also has Duskwatch Recruiter. So being able to just start activating that if the board stalls means that Andrea's going to pull ahead very rapidly. Wow, a lot of lands in hand for our players here. Ruben's on pair of forests. Ruben really needs to draw something like one of his heavy hitters, Secure the Wastes, <laughs> Archangel Avacyn. Look at Mangucci's hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Mangucci is about to draw a card off Duskwatch Recruiter, end of turn. And especially if, if Steve misses on spells, then Mangucci, Mangucci can go end of turn, activate Duskwatch Recruiter, untap, activate Duskwatch Recruiter. They both flip. All, your, all my creatures cost two colorless less. And if he's drawn two creatures, just probably play both of them. Okay, mm -hmm. trigger, and trigger. Mangucci didn't actually play spell this turn, so they flip now. That's right. He found a Bounding Crisis, so he's got something. That's the only spell in his hand, though. Steve needs to start attacking here. I, I, his creatures are getting big enough. He, I think he's getting to Ooh, the, oh, there's secure the waste the off the top. <laughs> That's a huge draw for Steve Rubin here in game one. You know, when you're flooding out, it yeah, doesn't hurt so bad. spells are good when you have a lot of lands. Thank you, Luis. <laughs> it's insightful commentary. Yeah, we bring in the experts, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> only the best. Well, it's because you can pay a lot of mana into X, and the X can <laughs> be very see, So we're going to explain it all the way. I like that. <laughs> all right, here comes Secure the Waste. He could wait till the end step to do this, though. The biggest reason not to is you want to minus Nissa this turn. Nissa's on four, so minus two, minus two is the natural progression. So I would kind of expect to see a secure for six, minus two, maybe some, uh, activate Gideon, secure for six, minus two, maybe some attacks, and then uh, next turn set up the minus two and Nissa again for lethal. Looks like he's doing the math. I mean, does Andrea have a way to recover from this secure? It feels like all of his advantage is incremental, right? It's a two for one here and a bounce spell, a bounce with a reflector mage there. Yeah, definitely. Like he, or I, I agree with you in that he's making, you know, an extra card or two a turn, and that's what the Bant Company deck does. It gets ahead by like a half a turn it's worth of mana on a lot of the turns. Mm -hmm. But when Steve is making six two twos, and then next turn there'll be three threes, then Andrea doesn't have like any one card that can just do all that much. 
<laughs> Future Matt Jerry is coming dangerously close to running out of dice as the secure yeah, always pushes it to the limit. They may have to run over for some <laughs> some of the other tables. You can see that one die sitting on top of all the soldiers <laughs> is representing a plus one plus one counter on each of them. And, and so also, Ruben's board has become just unmanageable here. Right, right? and also to, to Randy's point earlier that Andrea, besides not having like hugely swingy cards, doesn't have a ton of flyers. He's got Archangel Avacyn. So he, he's, he's not going to be able to threaten these Planeswalkers very easily with his current setup. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it seems like Andrea may be able to kill some of these creatures in combat. I mean, he does have four potential blockers, but okay. He's hard to imagine how he survives multiple turns of these attacks. Yeah, and these trades aren't even that bad for Steve. He's trading down a 4-4 four, four for a 3-3 three, three, and a 4-5 for a 3-3, three, three, but getting in, what, is Eight. that... Nine points of damage. Nine points of Ten damage. Ten points of damage. Wow. <laughs> Huge swings here for Steve Rubin in game one. It looks like he's going to be able to ride these Planeswalkers out. Let's see if Manguchi can come back. Randy, you were saying you couldn't think of many ways that he can come back from this point, given his main deck configuration. Still can't. Yeah, I think Steven <laughs> both secured the waste and the game with that, with that top deck here, since yeah, just making a million three threes, because two twos now, and the next turn that Nissa's not going anywhere. He is going to transform his Jace here. And you see Manguchi trying to figure out if he can survive a turn. Yeah, there's nine attackers coming at him, right? If Manguchi could collect a company into double Minister of Pain, the uh, oh. <laughs> exploit minus one, minus one card, there which you go. isn't in his colors or his deck, then he may have a <laughs> chance. But Right, so there are colors in sta cards in standard that could save right. him, <laughs> just not in his deck. Like, company into, into Reflector Mage, uh, I mean, that, that did take out one of the threats, but like you said a minute ago, Randy, that was nine going down to eight threats. I, I don't think that's going to get the job done here. Yeah, and, and that's the blocker. I mean, this is what company does, right? It's very good at these two-for-ones, incremental advantage. Yeah, but, but somehow he's gone just that, wider, sec yeah, that wide. secure the waste just ended up being a six-for-one somehow. <laughs> Steve's not even worried about blocks here. Once he minuses Nissa, then all of his three threes at the very worst trade up. Like he's, I mean, he just has enough attackers that it's actually just lethal on board if he activates the Nissa. Yeah, see, there's four blockers and eight attackers. I guess he doesn't. He, Andrea couldn't cast a spell, so the the pre combat bound increases will will make it so, hmm. which Steve does know about from the recruiter, will make it so. Uh, Steve isn't literally winning this turn, but. It's going to be pretty but hard it means Andre is <laughs> losing all his creatures. And going Steve's down getting, to, like, going down to a couple life, yeah. Okay, so he's going to activate his Gideon to turn it into a creature so that it picks up a plus one, plus one counter. Then minus Nissa. Now we're going to see that bounding crisis from Andre Mangucci. That's going to take down the biggest attacker, which in this case is Gideon. And provide another blocker, so five blockers Against versus six three threes. Six three threes. He probably also throws in the two-three plant. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't have to worry too much about his planeswalker thing. I guess reflector mage double blocks a three-three. The other three three-threes trade for soldier tokens, and then uh, Andrea falls to three. Yeah, that's gonna be. It's gonna be tough. For, tough for Andrea to come back from that, because he has to block such that he's not left with very many attackers. Maybe he's left with a reflector mage. But you're right that the one reason Steve isn't just shoving in is he doesn't want his Gideon to die on a crackback, particularly. He may actually leave himself some def leave some defenders for Gideon. Nope. In. Everybody in. I like it. I like it, too. So everybody's attacking. That Gideon, though, has been tapped down. It's actually not attacking. But every other token creature you see on the battlefield is. Really forcing Manguchi to just trade off the majority of his board just to stay alive. How does Manguchi recover from this? Yeah, these are just the, the only blocks he can realistically make to try and win the game. This puts him to one. <laughs> Steve Chu and Abyssin. <laughs> wow. I yeah, I mean. Hey, if you're going to have it, you might as well have it all. <laughs> uh, Abyssin is going to hit, and Andrea Manguchi <laughs> has, in fact, seen enough. He's going to scoop him up, and Steve Rubin wins game number one here in the finals at Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad. Yeah, I never understood the argument about win mores. Like, I like winning, and I like winning more and more <laughs> than I like winning. So, <laughs> All right, so that is going to do it there for game one. It goes to Steve Rubin. We'll be back right after this.
Put what you've learned from watching the Pro Tour into action next weekend at Game Day. Test your skills and your new standard deck at a store near you. Top finishers are awarded special Game Day prizes, including full art premium promo cards and a champion playmat for the winner. There's never been a better time to get into Standard. Set Rotation and Shadows Over Innistrad have altered the format's landscape dramatically. Blaze a new trail at Friday Night Magic. For more information, visit magic.wizards.com FNM. And welcome back to the feature match area here at Pro Tour Shadows Over Innistrad. We are in Madrid, Spain. We're one game out of this best three out of five, Randy. You like the change. First two games, no sideboards. I do. I, I don't think it's a giant impact, but 60% of guy, games being sideboarded is just a closer number to 67% than 80% would be. Mm -hmm. and, th and that mirrors the Swiss portion. Yeah, I closely. think you want the top eight. You want the tournament to be decided with as close to the same format as everybody played. As so why go to five then? Why go three out of five? Yeah. Well, I mean, I also think you don't want the Pro Tour to be decided by just one game of Mana Screw. You want to give more games so that you lower the variance a little bit. Let the, the more skillful player or the guy with the better deck have, have the chance to sort of more likely to win the thing he kind of earned. Yeah. It's, it's good for us too, right? More, I always more like magic, to watch more magic. Yeah. <laughs> what about for you, Luis? Uh, you know, you got a chance to play this a few times now since we've made the change. Well, given that I was up 2-1 against JC Tao. <laughs> uh, no, I, I do like the change. I, I, I think best We had to give the more skillful player time to get the thing he earned. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah. Yep, that, that, it, the system worked perfectly. Uh, I do like it for basically exactly the reasons Randy said. I like that the incentives aren't different for your top eight deck versus your Swiss deck. I don't like it that if you were to be like, well, I want to play Affinity, but Affinity is so bad in the top eight because it's four yep. post-board games potentially. So that, that, that being you know, mitigated, it's not exactly the same, but it's close enough, means that you're just going to pick your deck as to what you think would be best in the Swiss, and best three out of five is just a better format for top eights. So that means, of course, that this game, no sideboards. We're used to, the, you know, normally in, in a top eight, the, the game two would be already in the sideboards, but it's not. The players do have access to deck lists, however. So they're going to know every single card. Some of the players will have played the matchup in the evening against some of their teammates, and I know some of them just go to bed. Yeah, it's funny. I talked to Brad Nelson this morning. I walked in, and I, you know, I saw him at the, the breakfast bread for the top eight players. I'm like, Brad, how's your matchup? And he says... I don't know. My teammates don't get here till nine. <laughs> oh man! Hundred percent true story. He's, he went to bed. His teammates tested the matchup. He was in the second set of quarterfinals. They just hadn't had the chance to talk to anybody yet. No idea how the matchup would play. <laughs> That's really funny because I, I talked to Brad a little after that, and he said, "You know what? This is the best." They came in and they told him exactly what he needed to do. He played a few games. They were right, and he's like, "Great, I'm ready to go." That is awesome. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, he said he's getting kicked off the team. Well, it's Team Eureka. The tradition is you join the team and you win the Pro and Tour. And you win the PT. Martin Dang joined the team and won his first Pro Tour. Yo Larson joined the team and won his first Pro Tour. Yeah, and Brad didn't, so he's off. Good, I think, though, that run. if they're going to kick Brad off, they also got to kick Frank Carson off. Uh, he's pretty maybe. good with the spreadsheet. They might, they might actually bend <laughs> that right. rule. And maybe Brad can uh, stick around for a little while. I know he did a, a lot of good work. Okay, we're underway in game number two here. Steve Rubin. Up a game over Andrea Mangucci. That's green-white tokens in the hands of Steve Rubin. Lots of planeswalkers on that side of the battlefield. Mangucci doesn't have a ton of answers to those. Certainly not in the main. But he has a good start here. Sylvan Advocate. So, so Steve chose to play uh, Canopy Vista on turn one instead of a planes. He could have played a turn on three inspector because he wanted to play a green spell on turn two with, uh, with Vista. Let you know, the land sequencing is, is important in st this standard format. There, sure. it's, it's maybe not as complicated as when there were fetch lands like Flooded Strand and like uh, floating around, but it, you still have to kind of think about what you're doing, especially with the shadow lands where you have to like reveal a land and that sort of thing. Okay, it looks like Andrea Mangucci is just going to attack right into the opposing Sylvan Advocate. Steve Rubin's going to respect the possibility. Yep. Hmm. Interesting, and uh, he's going to follow up with a Duskwatch recruiter. Yeah, I think. Does Dromoka's command I think get I like the job the, done there? I think I like the block there because if Andrea had Dromoka's command, he could have just plus plus one and fought it anyway. Right. And now you're just giving him free, free two points of damage. <laughs> it was just a free attack. Now he's going to attack back, <laughs> representing well, the exact is, same this thing. This is less free because Andrea can double block here. Mm. And then even a Dromoka's command, plus plus one the advocate, make it a three four. It can fight one, but then it'll just 
it'll die to the other. So it's trading Dromoka's command and wow. his creature for both other creatures. Andrea's considering it too. And you know what? Ruben does have the Dromoka's command here. Yeah, and Andrea's certainly doing the math of like, okay, what happens if with he casts command? It's the, the thing is, because it fights, it still takes damage off whatever it kills. So sure. it's not a complete blowout. It is a two for two, which Andrea might be willing to accept. Wow, it's just going to single block here. Really? Doesn't that let the command? No, it's the same play, right? It, yeah, it ends up still a two for two. Thing. It ends up in the same place. It doesn't force Steve to use it, so. But right, he gave Steve the option. Yeah, which it's is funny a that weird. both players have given the opponent the option of doing a thing instead of forcing them to do a thing, which, though, if Steve had blocked last turn, it wouldn't have forced Andrea to do anything, which is part of the reason I like blocking there, is that he just has yeah. the option and it's a free roll. So Steve, Steve is just going to get plus one, plus one, and make Andrea sacrifice an enchantment, which, of course, he doesn't control. Interesting. So he just wants to, to trade Ooh. command for ad advocate, but does not want to trade advocate for well, recruiter. This didn't work out beautifully as the reflector mage puts the advocate right back in hand and clears away for an attack with the dust wash recruiter here from Mangucci, dropping Steve Rubin down to 16 life. Yeah. Up so does he have a further reflection? It's possible Steve w would have been happier had he done the other, made the other play, but I think it made sense the way, what he did. Upon further reflection. Yeah, I mean, once you think about it a little more. Got it. That's what you meant. Mm -hmm. Randy, we don't encourage him. <laughs> don't worry. He encourages himself uh, often enough. <laughs> so Steve has a lot of options here. He's got the Sylvan Advocate that it got bounced that he can't replay this turn. Uh, he's got Hangerback Walker. He's got Gideon. He's got Dromoka's Command. Okay, he's going to use Dromoka's Command here to put a plus one, plus one counter on the Thraben Inspector and fight and then play a Hangerback Walker. So either way, he was going to use up all of his mana that turn. He decided to uh, take down one of the main card advantage engines from Mangucci and put another threat out. And, and just like in game one, I like stacking counters on Thraven Inspectors because these Reflector Mages, <laughs> Andrea has got a, all Reflector Mages all, all the time here. You just don't want to bounce Thraven Inspector. All right, two, two drops there for Ruben. Passes it back to Mangucci, who returns the favor. He plays a Duskwatch Recruiter and a Jace before again passing the turn back. Though the more crowded these boards get, the better it gets for Steve. He has Planeswalkers, which thrive on crowded boards. And, you know, what he doesn't want to do, and this is why he didn't play Gideon last turn, is just play Gideon, but then lose it to just, like, Reflector Major Crisis tapping down a key blocker. The more creatures Steve can get into play, the, the safer his Planeswalkers become. Okay, here's Gideon. And he's going to immediately mm. make a Gideon Emblem here. Oh, nice. And he's leaving a mana up. He could have played Oath of Nissa, but he wants to pump Hanger back, though. I would have to imagine that Hangerback is going to get Reflector Maged here. Hangerback is not the, the most reliable plan against a band company. I mean, it's just a lot worse these days, right? Yes, Hangerback, well, Hangerback, you know, it, it ebbs and it flows. Against some decks, it's good. Uh oh, Andrea's coming yeah. up on a pretty brutal miss here. All right, he got oh, saved. Oh, the last two <laughs> saved him. A little, little sweat there from Andrea. It was like just a second, Jace, Look, until cards five and six. You don't make six. the finals yeah. of the Pro Tour if you miss on company. That's just, <laughs> that, 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 that's not part of your game plan. But yeah, Hangerback Walker against cards like Decoration of Stone, Silk Wrap, Stasis Snare, Anguish Done Making, Kalidus, Reflector Magic, does get weaker. On the other hand, if there's enough spot removal, Hangerback Walker still just is one of the best cards in the format. It's just such an intrinsically powerful card. Okay, so Steve Rubin's going to put another counter on the Hangerback Walker. Steve paying Before a slight price oath. for Oath of Nyssa here. He, he is unable to play Sylvan Advocate and Oath of Nyssa in the same turn. Like, the, he, the green man is actually a bottleneck. Okay. Hello. Well, hello. He found an Archangel Avison. Yeah, and that's a great draw. He's also got a land drop to make so he can cast it when, or, when he wants. And Steve's deck does have inevitability. He's got more powerful things going on. And... So Andrea has to worry about that. But Andrea does, you know, like Randy brought up earlier, has these incremental engines that Steve doesn't have. Jace, Duskwatch, Recruiter, that sort of thing. So kind of like the mid-game can, can favor Andrea if, it, if, it, if the board stalls a bit. But if it stalls too long, all of a sudden, then Steve's more powerful cards start coming online. We saw Jace got activated on end step, discarded an Evolving Wilds. And it looks like he's going to go ahead and take this turn to transform Jace. Yeah, likely to cast another company. Though, re remember, Steve's got a Gideon Emblem in play and a Clue in play at some point he's going to crack. Gideon Emblem just gives Steve really good long game prospects because every time a creatures interact in any way, Steve's are just better. So Andrea has to worry about that. And he has to worry about Avacyn, too. He, he, can't, <laughs> he can't really successfully mount an attack against untapped Avacyn mana. And 
Assuming Steve goes end of turn Avacyn, starts attacking with a 5-5 Vigilance Flyer because of the emblem, that, I mean, that, that's problematic as well. well. Andre has got two Reflector Mages to defend himself with. Which right. really aren't doing a ton right now. No, I mean, it's, Flash it's is a powerful card, but yeah. Flash is doing some serious work on Avacyn. One of, the, one of the, the plays that we saw come up in the Pro Tour was Reflector Mage, your Avacyn, the Purifier. Okay, end of your turn, play Avacyn, Archangel Avacyn. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you can't do that. It's like, well, they're not the same name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, looks like Bounding Crisis is what Minguchi's going to decide on here. He's going to tap down the Hanger Back Walker. Well, it was Collected Company flashback yeah. from Jace. Right. Finding Bounding Crisis and Dustwatch Recruiter. And a Recruiter. Dustwatch Recruiter. And unsurprisingly, Steve let it just be tapped because he wants to spend five men on Avacyn this turn. Like, yep. Avacyn's, you know, ended a battlefield trigger, very, very powerful, but five mana is so much. It's hard to imagine Steve sitting on five mana without... Especially without when Andrea Avacyn. knows about it and yeah. isn't going to, like, walk into a trap. Exactly. So, yeah, just get the big fire down. Sarah Angel, still a good card. <laughs> Archangel, 5-5 five, five Vigilance. Yeah. It has been upgraded. Oh, there's a Secure the Wastes. Wow, and Secure the Wastes for Steve Rubin. That's huge. And Remember that emblem. Ormondal may join, uh, yeah. may be able to join Addison if that's the way Steve wants to play this. And, you know, if if Steve does choose to use Westfall Abbey and turn Ormondal, you know, in, into a 9-7 or turn Abbey into a 9-7, that does tr then trigger and flip Addison. <laughs> this is just lethal next turn, right? He attacked with Addison now. He attacked with Addison plus Ormondal next turn. Yeah, plus what the is, three from Avicen. Yeah, this is. What does uh, Andrea do about that? I, I don't really know what he can do. Well, Looks like right, he's, he's going to kill Jace. Ruben's going to kill Jace first, though. The thing is, even if Ruben doesn't literally deal lethal next turn, Avicen will make uh, make it so uh, Andrea's board just common. disappears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like maybe the advocate survived, but nothing else sort of does. And, and Ink still needs to find a land to make that happen. Yeah, and he has not found one. He's going to get a discount on his creatures, though. They cost two, two colorless mana less. I think Hangerback's going to be hanging back in a second here. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a good turn. He can go Reflector Mage, Reflector Mage, Tireless Tracker. Yeah, that just doesn't it's come just very not gonna close to being Secure the Waste. Right, it's just not going to solve the problems that he's facing, though. He doesn't know about the Secure the Waste. The good thing is Bouncing Avacyn, she can't be replayed this turn. And right. that means that... Uh, that She's not going to be flipped if Ormondal is summoned next turn. Reflector Mage number two is going to put the Hanger Back Walker in hand. And now we're going to see Tireless Tracker as well from Minguchi. And his hand is on the battlefield. And it is impressive. That is a lot of creatures. He's attacking for a good chunk of damage here. Yeah, we're gonna uh, here's Steve Rubin, though, with Secure the Waste before blocks. And these are all 2-2s. Two yeah, we're going to see some... Some, some creatures go to the graveyard here. Some carnage here. Is yeah. he just going to trade off a bunch of these tokens? I, I think it's just so tempting to like go 3-4 three, Raven Inspector, eats an Advocate, double block Advocate, double block uh, one of the, the Crowl and Horde Howlers, mm -hmm. and I guess take, take eight alternately, and then that leaves you with one, two, three, four creatures. So he doesn't leave you with enough yeah, to flip that's why he's not. I'm not sure he wants... He's thinking about whether to double block the Howler right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. If he double blocks the Howler, he'll, he won't have... Armandal next turn. If he just blocks like this, he will. Well, he'll at least have the option of it with five creatures. Yeah. I think I'm with Luis that doing the double blocks, like you don't have to move in on Armandal next turn. Yeah, because if you take eight and you go down to eight here, but you're still left with four creatures in play and then you have an Avacyn and you're facing down one, two, three, you're facing down six creatures. So you have five to their six, but you're still just winning the game with Gideon Emblem, and Andrea has no cards in hand. Also, those Duskwatch recruiters are becoming small again, which is presumably why Steve uh, chose not to block them. I think this is the more conservative line. The other way, yep. you, you just lose to a top deck Reflector Mage pretty badly. Yep. Okay, well, Ruben's down to eight life here. Nothing terrible, but that Avacyn, he can't cast it quite yet, right? Yeah, but he's going to be able to cast it. Cast it on Manguchi's turn. Yeah, and so or combat either way. There's a Thraven Inspector. That was a great try. <laughs> Thraven Inspector is just one of the, uh, you know, the, the undersung heroes of the Pro Tour. Just just a great card. Yeah, it's, it's also did a lot of work in the limited portion. It's really I think really there's something to be said card. for upkeeping Avacyn here. 
Andrea has a Odritai's command in his deck. So he does have one copy of right. it. Right. Yeah. But you you almost just straight up lose to Odritai's command, or at least come close to losing to it if if Andrea has it. He knows you have Avacyn, and you are going to play it. So I think it's just That's a good point. Unnecessary risk. Okay, he's going to pass the turn, so that means we do get to see Avacyn. Did Andrea tap his only blue mana for that to sack that clue? Oh, he's got a Lumbering Falls hiding there. Oh, okay. I feel better now. Yeah, I, I, I do like summoning Ormondal here because that does flip Avacyn. You just sack all the other creatures, and then even if Andrea has like a Bounding Crisis to stop you, you just wipe his whole board with Avacyn. Yeah. He has to have like company into Reflector Mage Bound and Crisis, which is, seems like it's pretty difficult to beat anyway. <laughs> it's also just two quick turns in the air with Ormondal. If everything goes right. Or, or wrong, depending on your point of view. Yeah. Without hearing the players, at some point these these hand gestures go from at you know theoretical to Avicen attacking you. <laughs> okay, it looks like he's going for it. So we're going to see Ormondal Profane Prince yet again in the feature match area here. Mm -hmm. Everything gone. Transform this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fifteen in the air. Sorry. And Steve Dean's tap, which means he's not going to die next 15. turn, even if. Yeah, Somehow just, everything goes wrong. Yeah, there's just nothing that, that actually kills him next yep. turn. So huge attack yep. here for Steve Rubin. Remember, he's the one who's up a game. Manguchi's going to activate Swing one of his miss. Dusk Watch recruiters and hit nothing. Trigger, trigger, trigger. Yes. Avacyn flips first. Transform, transform, transform. Andrea's board gets purified. Wow, Jeez. this is yeah, gross. They're talking about who's the active player and how the triggers go uh, up. Yeah, I think they're trying to figure out like whether he, he has to dust watch now. And he does. He finds a bounding crisis. That's not going to quite do it uh -huh. because, yeah. And that's not going to do it at all. Andrea Manguchi is going to scoop him up, and Steve Rubin now one game away. Wow. I'm sure we don't have stats on this, Randy, but being up two in a best three out of five, I mean, you are so far ahead, right? So many things can go wrong, and you can still win the Pro Tour from this spot. It's certainly a nice question to have. Yeah. You lose that first one, though, and that's when your mental game starts to get checked. <laughs> right? You're like, I can't possibly lose from here, right? You can't uh, really afford to think that way. You have to avoid thinking that way. Of course. I, I won my first game against Showdown. I was like, I'm, I'm going to lose this match. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I mean, obviously, I was just going to play as best I could, but I, I, I was not super hopeful. Fair. All right, 2 we'll 0, though, you would have been hopeful. At 2 0, I would have been feeling a lot better because there, there we're in the realm of like maybe he pulls a 5 1 game. <laughs> right, right. Uh, why don't we take a look at the sideboards here, gentlemen? Um, Start with Andrea Mangucci. Can take a look, and we saw this in the last round. So he's got the Dromica, the Sirach, Declaration in Stone, Dispel Invasive Surgery, Negate, and Tragic Arrogance. Anything jumping off the, the page to you, gentlemen? Tragic Arrogance has looked like it would be decent in some of the games, but it's less good than you might think against a token deck because if they are planning to secure end of turn, then it, it, it is it's still not going to wipe their board. It, it is funny that it makes them choose a Planeswalker, too, <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes Steve will have multiple Planeswalkers. Decoration of Stone does seem like it, it's legit, though, because it can kill Sylvan Advocate or Hangerback Walker or just wipe a bunch of tokens. All right, let's take a look at what Steve Rubin may or may not be bringing in for sideboards. He's uh, got a wide range of cards here. Yeah, he also has Tragic Arrogance, and I also don't particularly like it without having played the matchup. I do like the idea of Linvala, though. Linvala seems like a pretty good way to be combat Bant, because Bant gets ahead by like having an extra 3-3 in pressure in your life, and you just play Linvala and get back into it. Uh, I don't Randy, know. Randy, can it be correct for both of them to bring in Tragic Arrogance? Yeah. <laughs> like, doesn't one have to be wrong? <laughs> well, no, that's <laughs> that, 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 not entirely true. Okay. I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> I, I didn't say it. I asked. Uh, it, <laughs> It might be counterintuitive, but they, because Tragic Arrogance gives you so much control over it. When you, you fire it yeah, off, how you, you build up off. your board. It's, 
it's possible that both players envision this board state where Treasure Gardens would be good and think that they can take advantage of it best. Though it does mm -hmm. sound better in Mangucci's deck if any player was going to bring it in. Okay. Extra secure the way it sound, might, sounds like it might yes. be pretty good here. Every time Steve drew secure, it was fantastic. Yep. He kept drawing it with six lands in play and uh, Gideon, but I definitely agree with you. It looks like a good card. I don't know about Quarantine Field. That also seems like it could be impactful when they both just have, you know, six, seven lands and a bunch of creatures in play, but I don't know how many of those games Steve wins already. Mm -hmm. Does it depend, how much does it depend on uh, Dromica's commands either coming in or out for Mangucci there? Uh, yeah, you, you don't want a Quarantine Field against Dromica's right. commands. Though, Lambold Pacifist, now that I think about it, it's not bad. Yeah, that could, it could do some work. I mean, if they're, if you play a turn two Lampold Pacifist, their Sylvan Advocates aren't chipping in for damage early, and you aren't able to, uh, you know, you're not going to just die to random Reflector Mage as it can trade for a Bounding Crisis. That, that sounds like a mana advantageous way to take advantage of, of what's going on. I'm curious, do you, do you know what those are for in general? M White Winnie mostly. Okay. That, that, that's what that's what just a big blocker. That's all the that's what we use Lampold passes for when, in all of our testing. I assume it's here for like kind of that same matchup, but if it's good against Bant Company too, it sounds like a very good sideboard card. Fair. Steve Rubin's deck seems good against Bant Company so far. Yeah, it, this deck just seems awesome. I, it I, really does. You know, I, I played against it once. I played against Steve in the Pro Tour. We, yeah. we watched them play all weekend. And it seems like they really did it. Like their their deck looks very well positioned for this field. I you do you think said it did it did really well in the field as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, it performed admirably day one and day two. I do want to give some credit to MTG Mincard as well. I think that their their take on Bant Company was very successful for them. I mean, it's a lot of good players. Like, I think Li Shi Tian went 9 and 1 with it. He was the only guy to go 9 1 in the 10 constructed rounds. Just couldn't put anything together in limited. <laughs> couldn't put it together in limited. Yeah, that was a problem. You know, Steve's, or, uh, they were, uh, Katsuhiro Mori was playing it and against Andrea Mangucci in that last round of Swiss. So they were both in position to, to win and, and at least get into the tiebreakers for top eight. It, it's very funny. This, this band company list is literally two cards off from the, the list I would have played in the Pro Tour. Wow. I would have, the, the list that I play tested like at the end of play testing was uh, minus two Archangel Avacyn plus two Tireless Tracker. That, that's like the only difference. Is that the main deck or the sideboard In the main two? deck. Uh, the sideboard, very different. But yeah. But I, I think that they, their list is very, very good. I mean, I, I agree. strongly considered playing it. It's just all great cards. Yeah, I think their sideboard worked out pretty well for them over the course of the weekend too. They, their winning percentage, like everybody on their team who played this deck did well. Okay, we're underway here in the third game between Andrea Mangucci and Steve Rubin. This could be the one that gives Rubin the trophy if he's going to win it. Otherwise, Mangucci has a lot of work to do. He's got to win three games in a row post sideboard here against Steve Rubin. It all has to go perfectly for him if he's going to be the one to walk away with the big prize. Oath of Nyssa, the turn one play here for Rubin. Nice turn two play here for Mangucci, though. He's got Jace already. Yeah, Jace is a, is a fantastic card, though. I think in this match, you'd rather play an advocate on turn two a lot of the time, just because you really you really need to be ahead on the board before Steve lands a Planeswalker. Because if Steve is able to go hanger back into advocate plus pump hanger back into Gideon, it's hard for Andrea to assemble a way to, to, to pressure that Gideon. I'll tell you what, Ruben has exactly that sequence lined up here. Uh, if you look at his hand on the right-hand side of your screen, so... Mangucci's going to have to do something now, maybe a Reflector Mage to get rid of the Hanger back. Looks like a Bounding Crisis to untap, <laughs> to untap Jace. Jace. Kind of cute there. That is cute. Yeah, that's the normal mode. <laughs> okay, and here we go. It's Sylvan funny. Advocate, leave up that mana. You described this play a minute ago, Luis, and he has the Gideon ally of Zendikar in his hand, too. So for as good as... Uh, Reflector Mage is against Hangerback Walker. If you don't have Reflector Mage, Hangerback could be pretty annoying. Duskwatch Recruiter, one of one of the biggest winners of this Pro Tour in terms of just how far its stock has gone up. I think the card is just great. This is this is a matchup where it gets overpowered though. This isn't this is not as much of a grindy matchup because it feels like Fair. Steve's Steve's swings are just so big that a, a Duskwatch Recruit activation or two is not going to change things. Yeah, I mean Andrea has to basically play a tempo game, right? Yeah bounces and taps and try to just sneak in 20 before Steve can take control. I, I do really like this attack, though, because normally I would just snap off the block there uh, yeah. tra and trade. But uh, the reason Andrea, I think, makes that attack is because he has a tragic arrogance. And if, if he can kill the hanger back, he can choose just the 1-1 Thopter as the only creature Steve gets to keep. But Steve's all through it. Yeah. Steve falls down to 17 as a result of that attack. 
draws a land for the turn, and it looks like he's all set up for Gideon, if that's the plan he wants to take here. You know, Tragic Eric is actually looking pretty good for, for Andrea here, I think. I mean, it's not like it's just going to win him the game here, but it looks like it's going to impact dramatically what would otherwise be a very difficult board for him to get through because the more I'm seeing these games play out, the more favorite I think green-white is. Yeah. It just feels like it does such a good job of stalling the board and making it so Bant can't really win. Like, all those games, Andrea was more, like, trying to not lose than he was actually able to win. Yep. And Tragic Arrogance just has a huge swing. Sometimes it's bad, but sometimes it looks like it could be absurd. Steve Rubin's going to attack with the Hanger Backwalker and the Sylvan Advocate here. And Manguchi's just going to take it. Yeah. So four damage. Oh, before that, though, Dromica's command is going to add a plus one, plus one counter and fight the tireless tracker. And another Sylvan Advocate is the follow-up play for Ruben. So instead of playing a Gideon this turn, he's decided to take this line with the Dromica's command and the second Advocate. Like even right now, Jace now flips, and then Tragic Ericans just kills two Sylvan Advocates. That does seem really good. Wow, and a Reflector Mage he just found with that Jace as well, so... Hanger Backwalker is going to get reset at some point here, too. And Gucci in the tank here, maybe just working through what he wants to do with this uh, tragic arrogance. Not the is. only five mana spell he has to think about. You saw that he kind of mapped out everything and pointed. Luis, can you walk us through what just happened there? It happened quite quickly. Yeah, so Tragic Arrogance lets Andrea select one, uh, basically each permanent type, the excluding lands, mm -hmm. for Steve, and Steve sacrifices the rest. And so he chose to let Steve keep Hanger Backwalker and sacrifice the two advocates. It happened for himself also, but Andrea only had one creature in play because he flipped Jason into a Planeswalker, so he, he's able to, to retain all his creatures there. Actually, if Steve has a, ends up with a clue in play, you can choose the clue as the artifact to make yeah. him sack his hangar back walkers. It's kind of cool. Yeah. And Andrea, of course, had a clue, but he only had no other artifacts, so it, it didn't impact him. I mean, that was five mana kill two self advocates. That, that's a good card. That, that does, does some work. Steve's still in pretty decent shape here. Like, he can make Gideon and pass the turn with a hanger back. Andrea can bounce the the hanger back and attack with the crisis, but that's not gonna that's not gonna take out Gideon. Andrea does have an active chase. And both players have Archangel Avacyn in hand, which I was about to ask how the flavor <laughs> judge would, would think feel about that. Uh <laughs> You know, the Flavor Judge doesn't actually rule on Legends being on the same side of the table, it just happens too frequently, so it gets a pass. But here we see, I mean, Gideon can go down to one here, but that's just not the same as zero. It's just going to keep making tokens. Ruben's left up one mana for his hanger back walker here. Minguchi's deciding how he wants to approach this. He does have multiple options here. He's got that Archangel Avacyn in his hand and the Reflector Mage, too. And he, he, he can flash back Tragic Arrogance at some point with, uh, with, with, the, with the Jace there. Randy, what do you got for our sideboard uh, update? Uh, looks like Manguchi took out two Dromoka's commands, one Recruiter, and one Jace to make room for two Tragic Arrogance and two Declaration in Stone. Steve Rubin, meanwhile, minus three Thraben Inspector, minus two Secure the Waste. So he has a different read on Secure the Waste than we got from those first couple of games. Minus one Hanger Backwalker, minus one Dromoka's command. All that makes room for... Two Lambhold Pacifists, a Linvala, an Evolutionary Leap, and three Tragic Arrogance. So, so five total Tragic Arrogance sideboarded in. Both <laughs> players think it's good here. It would be unfortunate for one of them if there if it was a, not the best card to board in. Tragic, even. Chase is going to plus on the Knight, which is going to, and then allow the uh, Krasis to attack here. Ruben's got to decide if he wants to jump block. Pretty good for Ruben either way. I mean, Gideon survives either way. If, if you don't jump block, Gideon's very far from emblem him, using an emblem, so probably you'll never get to do that. But if you, but if you do jump block, you're not going to be able to double block the Krasis next turn if you make another knight. And Steve does have multiple hanger backs in hand, so he can't cast them. Actually, he flipped one upside down just to remind himself, because you, you don't want to forget and like <laughs> b base a plan about being able to cast something with Reflector Mage. 
I would lean towards letting Gideon go to one here, I think, just to have a bigger board presence when you play Avacyn next turn. But I think it's very close. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if Manguchi was paying close attention yeah. in there, because he just took the hanger back walker that he drew and turned it upside down in his hand. Yeah. I, and you know, these guys it's actually used to be teammates. I wonder if this is something they would ever talked about. It's just funny, because if he noticed it. asymmetrical, too, right? Yes. It's not, if, if he had monocolored sleeves, yes. you wouldn't notice, but Mengu should be able to see that there's three cards upside down in yeah. his oh, hand. Wow, two, two Jaces pointed downwards. Well, three. Yeah, three. Is there, is there it's three, three now? Yeah, okay. But still, just make a token pass with Avacyn up is pretty reasonable here. <laughs> it's funny. It actually might be to Steve's benefit for Andrea <laughs> to know that he has three hanger backs in hand because if I'm Andrea and Steve passes with four cards in hand and one's a hanger back, I'm, I'm thinking Avacyn. If he passes with four cards in hand and I know three are hanger backs, I'm that not can't thinking Avacyn. <laughs> wow. <laughs> or I'm, I'm, I'm less likely to. So you think Steve's got him is trying to next level him? That could be. It looks like That's Gideon's an awesome reverse tell. Is that what he's doing? Yeah, brawl with Jace here. Steve seems like a pretty straight-up dude, though, so I actually would be surprised if that's exactly what was going on. Yeah, also, it's not going to really change any of the action here, right? Is Avison still well, just going to be the play, right? It's going to change how Andrea plays. Because Andrea now, like, normally, you know, he would think, like, if Steve couldn't play anything, you'd just send your two creatures at Gideon and play more creatures. But now he might activate Lumbering Falls and send three creatures at Gideon, so Avison can't save Gideon. On the other hand, what that does is it leaves you pretty open to secure the wastes. Uh, okay. Mm. So, yeah, Andrea's going to respect the Avacyn slash secure. And there she is, Avacyn. Hits the battlefield <laughs> on end step. Now Steve has to worry about an opposing <laughs> Avacyn, because if Steve attacks and Andrea sla slams Avacyn, then Steve's Avacyn, Steve loses his Avacyn, unless he emblems Gideon first, which actually he pretty oh. good chance that he does. Oh, that's interesting. He also has the play. He could also play Hanger back for zero, triggering his own Avacyn, then emblem Gideon, and then play two more hanger backs. <laughs> one is crazy. a two-two. Then then attack with Avacyn. Does, do you think he has practice getting this sequence correctly? <laughs> I, he does now. I, I, you know, and that that was kind of why they built the deck. Yeah, yeah. Hanger back for zero to flip Avacyn is such a sweet play. Especially against this band company deck, it kills virtually all their creatures. Wow, is it going to kill Jace here as well? Yeah. Interesting. Now, Andrea does have the option of waiting and playing his Avacyn in his own upkeep, right? Ooh, he did not emblem he didn't make the emblem first, so now he's just going to lose his Avacyn. Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> so maybe there's a little bit of work to be done on the sequence still. <laughs> Yikes. Right now, he's throwing a hanger back away for no benefit. That's right. Hanger back doesn't do anything, so he's going to have to get back online here and it looks like he's going to be hanger back walker for three and also make an emblem wow so steve is actually forced to emblem there because if he zeroes gideon then abyssin uh can can hit presumably uh i guess can actually kill gideon it can take gideon down to one but he wants to make sure he gets the long game uh, value out of the emblem first. So you think his plan was to make an ally until the Avacyn Yeah, presumably came down? if he wanted to emblem, he would have done it before attacking. Uh, just, presumably. Just to get an extra damage through. Though but he, facing the enemy Avacyn, he now changes his plan and goes for the emblem. Well, he did. I think he also may have wanted to uh, play a smaller hanger back. But because he, like multiple hanger backs maybe, but because cause he still has one hit left in hand. But be, I think he's in the mode of like, I probably can't beat Reflector Mage at this point, so just playing the biggest hanger back possible is is the highest value. Like, normally you would not want to play a hanger back for that much against a deck that's playing Reflector Mage, but here I think, you know, Steve is, is moving into the phase where it's like, if Andrea has certain cards, it's going to be very difficult for, for Steve to win. All right, Andrea has uh, activated his Lumbering Falls. Steve actually has the additional challenge here of if he kills any of Andrea's creatures, now also Andrea's Avacyn flips, which may be not quite as brutal if, if Steve's had flipped, but still impacts the board. I mean, pre at the very least, pressure Steve's life total. A 6-5 that deals three to you, you know, yeah. puts Steve on a two-turn clock. Okay, Avacyn's going to attack Gideon. 
And now on Steve's everything else is going to attack Steve. And Steve can just eat one of those creatures, but then that'll just flip the Avacyn. So Steve will take you know, five here and then three more on upkeep. He decides to trade with Lumbering Falls? Uh, he, he doesn't trade because there's a Gideon in Oh, of course. Fight. He just eats the Lumbering Falls. No, he didn't block anything. He, I did. I think he, I thought he blocked the Lumbering Falls. That's I did what too. I thought, I, too, I, but I, it went back to, the, to Andrea's land pile. It did. I don't know why, though. Did he just not block? If no, so he, he I think they just didn't. Okay, I guess he must not have blocked because Lumbering Falls didn't die, and it, oh, he plus Jace on the on the hanger back. So it was it was a block, but it just it was bounced. just not a trade. Yeah, it was a bounce. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. I did not see that he had plus Jace on the hanger back. That right. makes a lot more sense. Okay, but this also means that Avison is not going to transform. Wow, this has been a intense game. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We talked about how Andrea's path to victory is a tempo game. A Krasis, a Reflector Mage. He got he got Avacyn for full value. I mean, even the the, the Tragic Arrogance was kind of tempo. It was five right. mana for four mana, but right, right. it still it reduced Steve's board presence dramatically. But yeah, look, there's a getting him on play. A long game is still it's still going to be pretty difficult for for Andrea to win if it goes super long. But he's got he's certainly got the advantage right now, and Avacyn is such a powerful card that it's hard, true story. Hard to imagine Steve being able to win this without killing Avacyn very soon. Oh, hmm. wow. There's the Ojutai's command. Ojutai's command off the top for Mangucci. Which cuts off some of Steve's outs. Like, uh, I, I have to imagine Andrea is going to concentrate on keeping Ojutai's command man up. Okay. So once again, Jace is going to plus on the hanger back, the bigger of the two. Archangel Avacyn's going to bash. Yeah. It looks like Andrea does not want to he does not want to risk killing Steve's hanger back walkers because then that'll give Steve more draws overall. Yeah, I, I think what's happened here as well is that Andrea said, I'd like to target your hanger back and then attack, and Steve may have said, hold on a second. Because at Steve least putting the idea of Dromica's command yeah, into Andrea's Dromica's head. Dromica's command would be an impactful card here, and you'd want to do it before the Jace ability resolves. Right, so it looks like Steve has said, yeah, okay. Oh, wow, that, that's a huge draw. Wow, and he does have the Dromica's command here. And remember that that counter, two counters goes to three, becomes a 4-4 because of Gideon Emblem, trades with Avacyn and makes three 2-2 two, two flyers. That could actually just give Steve right in the game. Whoa! It kills Avacyn, puts three 2-2 two, two flyers into play. This could be a huge swing for Steve Rubin. Andrea Mangucci has to sit back in his chair and process what this does. <laughs> Andrea has Mangucci another Archangel has another Avacyn. Avacyn in his hand. Which to, can save your first Avacyn by kind of like cycling. Like you just play Avacyn, choose to keep the first one, you still get the indestructible. Avacyn won't flip because she does specify non-angel, um, but you still keep, get to keep an attacking Avacyn. Is that the play here? He wouldn't be able to leave up Ojutai's command. Yeah, but Steve has no cards in hand, so I'm less concerned about that. Oj you, you leave up Ojutai's command when you're winning. This makes that the winning a little less clear. So he should go for it? No. It's not bad to go for it. Steve does still end up with three 2-2 two, two flyers, which is kind of annoying because then next turn your Avacyn can't attack. Ah, uh, sure. Except that Andrea does then have a Jace on five, which he's already used this turn, and then he can potentially flashback Tragic Arrogance, which can, you know, again, eliminate some of the hanger back tokens. Mangucci's going through all the possible permutations here, and he has decided to go for Archangel Avacyn, assuming that this one's just going to go right to the graveyard. Like you said a minute ago, Luis, the uh, hangerback walker well, <laughs> still dies. Uh, Andrea could have actually chosen to go the other way. He could have chosen to keep the new Avacyn. The old one would, would have died, and then the hangerback would not have, have fought. And he, Steve would have ended up with a hangerback with hmm. three plus plus one counters on it. He'd just have a pair of three three hangerbacks with the Gideon Emblem, so four four. Is that, is that better for Andrea? He doesn't have to deal with the flyers. It looks like he, he is chumping one of them. So this ends up actually working out a little better for Andrea, I think, than, than just losing his absence. But it's funny that you would actually consider that play. Well, secure the waste. That's not a bad draw Jeez. either. Jeez. Oh. Wow, this game has been really awesome. Very difficult to tell who's in the lead at any given point during this game. It's been so swingy. It's felt like Andrea has been had the upper hand. But Ruben was secure the waste here. Remember, he still has a Gideon emblem as well, so these are two twos. Gets around Ojutai's command cleanly as well. And he, and he does now have the ability to double block this Avacyn with a pair of 2-2s. 
will not be indestructible oh, next turn. Oh, it's a tragic arrogance. Oh, secure the ways. wow, it was a tragic arrogance. Okay, what does that do now to the board state? <laughs> oh, man. Um, this is a mess. You can keep a reflector mage and a Jace. <laughs> Telepath unbound. It's possible that Steve... Yeah, he could have pumped his hanger back and then kept one of the Thopters to get four more tokens, but I think he's just going to keep at this point the, the, the big hanger back. Just to, hoping that no reflector mage. Oh, he can show keep up. a token too because it's artifact. He can choose artifact and creature for himself. Sure. So this this yeah that sounds definitely better. And then you keep you have Andrea keep reflector mage and that's presumably Andrea's worst creature. Well, how big of a swing is this for Ruben? Uh, with this, uh, probably the best card he could have drawn. <laughs> Turns out boarding, both players boarding and tragic Eric was just great. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. But like you said, the timing of it and, you know, how you develop out your board really matters. In this case, he just happened to draw it at a fantastic time. Andrea Mangucci is just nodding his head. He, there's nothing he can do here. So it looks like Steve might actually just keep the two flyers, so he's going to make three more tokens with Hanger Back. So he's just going to try to close this thing out in the air. What did he save the mana for? Uh, he just, he just, it, it he just, just cost five. He just played arrogance. He did, he could have pumped. No, I mean he could have he could have made a four four hanger back. Yeah, I think I think what fine. happened is he he was gonna keep hanger back and token. And he changed and it, his mind. It's still better uh. to change your mind, even if you realize you would have wished you'd done something it. earlier. He saw him just pound the table right there. Yeah. He just realized he could have had an extra two two flyer. But I think he, regardless, it's still better to go with the plan that's better, even if it. Totally you know, agree. You know, totally even agree. if you realize it and you're like, man, that that, that kind of sucks. Hundred percent agree. Okay. Yeah, Steve. Steve's actually. Reasonably far ahead, you know, Ormondal could come out at some point, wow. too. Westfell Ab has been kind of a non-issue so far, but... <laughs> Was that another tragic it's arrogance? ten power worth of flyers either way. Yeah. That being said, it's much better just to keep all the th Thopters in play, because it so, forces too. Andrea to do something, uh, you know, a lot harder to, to, to get out of these things. Linvala the Preserver was the draw for Ruben? So it was. So the... It's actually good for Andrea because he had an Ojatai's command in hand that he was going to have to cast this turn anyway. So Steve drawing a six drop uh, creature was kind of exactly where he wanted to be. If Steve drew like a Gideon or Nyssa, Andrea was in a huge amount of trouble. So now Andrea gets to flashback Tragic Air against with, uh, with his new Jace next turn. So this game is very much still going on. Wow, this game is incredible here in the finals. Steve Rubin up two games to zero, just trying to close out against Manguchi, who will not go away. Yeah. Now, and Andrea was going to get to flashback tragic arrogance with a new Jace either way. Yeah. It's just he got a free lit Vala. Ruben's going to attack with. No, actually, all I guess given that he was going to flashback tragic arrogance, maybe just bringing Jason to play and drawing a card and then tragic arrogance away and Linvala along with everything else. <laughs> it would have ended up being funny, being being good. But it would have gained Steve five life because that's why Steve played it pre-combat. Mm. There's a collected company off the top for Mangucci. I think this Andrea Mangu Mangucci's ahead. <laughs> he is right. This turn he just has the tragic arrogance though. Yeah. He, otherwise he's he's gonna. He's just gonna lose anyway. So. Okay, so he's going to transform a Jace. That means he's going to lose the original Planeswalker Jace, but this one has five loyalty, and you see he's lining up tragic arrogance here. Wow, what a swingy game. Keep a Thopter. Jace goes down to two. That Reflector Mage has now survived two tragic arrogances. Just a <laughs> it's a very <laughs> humble Reflector Mage. <laughs> veteran. <laughs> the way this game's going, this is probably where Steve draws, like, Secure the Waste or Archangel Ivison. <laughs> we have not seen a, This is the swingest game I've seen in the top eight. Yeah, seriously. Worst comes to worst, Steve does have activating Westvale Abbey, but... Oh, the other Jace minus ten just to start making some humans. He drew a Nyssa, now what does that do? Starts off by making a plant, which is a one, two. Okay. Next turn can make a, another plant or can give creatures a plus and plus one, which given the two, two flyer. Okay, this is huge, right? Collected company now from Andrea Mangucci. Let's see what he hits. This could be the card that powers him through the late game. There's a reflector mage right off, also a Tyler's tracker. Anna Nissa and a bounding crisis. 
And even a Duskwatch recruiter, he just gets his choice. The Royal Sampler, yeah. Oh, man. Minguchi really just has his choice of what, how he wants to push forward into the late game here. What's going to give him the most card advantage? What's going to give him the most immediate board impact? Yeah, this is an embarrassment of riches. Nissa's very powerful here because she just immediately gets a forest and flips. Reflector Mage also, uh, you know, pretty safe choice because it just kills the 2-2 flyer, which, given your head so many cards right now, seems like it's pretty good. Well, it looks like he's going to actually yep. kill the plant. Try to get it. And then just be plus, attack. presumably plus Jace on the, on the flyer. Right. And this lets him attack, attack. the Nissa for two. Yeah. Minguchi is down to seven life, but he's scheduled to take no damage next turn. It is funny that when you hit a collecting company, you actually kind of wish that the rest of the cards weren't hits because now, <laughs> now his, his future companies are a little less likely to hit. And it looks like he's going to immediately make an Ashaya token, so that's a 4-4. Four, four. Wow, he's got enough mana left over to fire up Lumbering Falls. Wow, this Which turn. Kills Nessa. Incredible. Yeah, killing this is pretty good. Also, taking Steve to two is, is pretty effective. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that's just what Andre Yeah, does. he did. He just went at Steve Rubin. Bring you down to two and force Steve to come up with something. He finds a land off the top of his library here. He has a Westvale Abbey, but down to two life. That will do wow. it. Wow. Andrea Mangucci takes game three. What that, a game. that was an incredible game. He can only smile after that one. <laughs> what an insane game. He you want to see smile. what the percentages of each player to win at like, every given turn? <laughs> it was just like that graph would just be like up and down peaks and valleys. So. Oh, man. I hope the rest of our games go that same way. That's incredible stuff. So does Andrea, if you look <laughs> at that smile. Yeah. I, I see you, Steve, smiling too. How do we take a look at uh, one of the key cards down the stretch there, Reflector Mage? Yeah, this is one of the most standard defining cards. It, it it pairs perfectly with Collected Company. You see it played in Blue-Eyed Humans as well. It it just really keeps, you know, three and three to five mana creatures really get taxed by Reflector Mage. It's hard it's hard to, to, to play as without without keeping in mind the fact that yeah. they, they, they will be reflected upon and <laughs> you, you will not be able to replay them. Avison, of course, Archangel Avison, she she fights that by having flash, which is really, really effective against Reflector Mage. Randy, I, I'm, I'm not able to speak on this impartially, this, <laughs> this type of card. So I'll ask you, when you first <laughs> saw this card, did you think standard impact? I, I was thinking more like sweet limited card. Yeah, probably I thought not. it was, I mean, Mana War was a standard card way back in the day, if you go back. So, I mean, it's not unprecedented, but no, I had the same first reaction you did. It was like, wow, this is, I'm going to first pick this in limited a lot. Looks like a great card. Turns out even better than we thought. Yeah, even better. In fact, better in standard than in limited, <laughs> just because yeah, we didn't play a lot of blue white in fair. that format. Um, Luis, you just mentioned uh, one of the potential foils, well, to a lot of things in standard right now. Archangel Avison, just breakout monster card from yeah. Shadows over Innistrad. Archangel Avison is, first of all, the card that makes this green white tokens deck work in, in a lot of ways because. She's great when there's like a, a, this giant combat step full of creatures. The, the Hangerback Archangel Avacyn interaction is incredibly powerful. And she just gives them another flying flash threat to threaten opposing planeswalkers, to play at instant speed. You see her popping up in banned company lists. Uh, you can see her in basically any list that has white mana and creatures just considers Archangel Avacyn. Yeah, she's going to win the Pro Tour one way or the other. That is very, very true. Andrea has two basically just for value. He has two despite the fact you can't get them with Collected Company. Yeah, that Steve has the full four. Slots in a collected company deck that don't get hit by company are your most scarce resource. Absolutely. You, you have the four collected companies. You have 24 or 25 land. You know, the other like 31 slots, you really have to, you really have to figure out, or 35 slots rather, you really have to figure out what you want to put in those, in those cards. And so when we see a creature specifically that doesn't hit that, we know it's an absolute Right. The, 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 the non-company cards in Andrea's deck are the two Archangels, Dromoka's Command and Ojatai's Command. That's it. You just can't afford more. Yeah. Oh my. We're getting word from the floor that wow. Steve actually thought there was a Gideon Emblem in play already when he attacked with that Avacyn. Yeah, it's very understandable where you have this like sequence of plays lined up and then you proceed with it and then you realize you like didn't do one of the things you thought about. You're like, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And then you do number four without having done number three. It's just... It it's, does happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's really interesting how that works. I, I never worry about those players. You know, if you make occasionally a, you know, a clerical error like that, but you've got the planning down. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's a lot easier to fix that than than, than not knowing right, the secrets. Exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. That, that, yeah, he had the right plan. I it's, mean, you don't want to make those mistakes. But. Well, of course not. He's actually know. talking through it out loud here, too. I mean, Tim, Tim Willoughby down on the floor is just sort of relaying the chat. He's explaining that uh, the thing that distracted him was he wanted to find out if bounding crisis was going to happen. So he wanted to move to combat to see if there was going to be a bounding crisis. But it's, once you do that, you can't make the emblem anymore. So right. it's kind of, you know, thinking about, okay, here's my sequence. Now I want to execute the sequence as efficiently as possible, playing around as many things as possible. And... Like you said, he clearly knows what he's doing. I, you know what? I also really like the way he's just talking through this. I mean, you might think you don't really want to let your opponent in, in to, to understand what you're thinking about, but you got to get that out of your system. Yeah. Totally. I mean, at some level. you got to own it. You own it. You get it out of your system. You talk through it. Andreas laughing with him about it a little bit. And uh, I think that's going to help Steve just get it out of his system, get it out of his head, and focus on game four and... Well, game five if necessary. <laughs> Very few of the de the turns in Steve's deck are easy, so <laughs> I, I, I think I think that you know him knowing what he wants to do every turn is very important, and he's done a very good job of that so far. Even if maybe he missed a step on that particular turn. So I also like Steve's chances on the play here. He's he's got a deck which I believe is favored in the matchup. He has it looks like a very good plan. Tragic arrogance is an annoying card to deal with, but it's still. It still looks pretty good for the deck full of Planeswalkers against the deck full of ground 2-2s two and 3-3s, three which is essentially what Bant Company is, even if, even if it's got a lot of powerful synergies going on. Oops. Yeah, very good player, very good deck, very good matchup. Still got to like Steve Rubin's chances here. He's got two more shots here to try to earn his first Pro Tour trophy in his first Pro Tour top eight. But Mangucci, he's been here before in the top eight. And he's just got to win back-to-back -back games. I'm sure he's done it many, many times in his career. Yeah, it was Pro Tour journey to Knicks. Yep. Yeah, I remember he was playing like the Naya Xenagos uh, at Elspeth deck, I believe. It's actually, I mean, it's Ruben who's the platinum pro here too. Yep. yep. Mangucci was silver. I'm sure he'll move up to at least gold <laughs> with these points. So many big names making this top eight. It's, it's interesting things to all the races for Worlds invites, too. I saw that uh, Seth Manfield actually moved ahead of Owen Turtenwald in the Player of the Year race by one point. Yeah, one point ahead. And then there's a giant gap. I mean, you could have made some ground there. Brad could have made <laughs> some ground there, but... I just like that I'm mentioned in the same <laughs> breath as Worlds invites and races nowadays. <laughs> you know, you're winning one of them. Uh, which one? There's a Hall of best Hall of Famer slot, and you're actually six <laughs> points ahead of John. Nice. I, I was not aware of such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew about the slot. I just yeah, it's yours right now. Like I, I have been getting very lucky lately, and I enjoy that. But I, it has been a while since I've like paid attention to the, the exact races because it just hasn't been relevant to me. So I, it's good news that it is now, I guess. Yeah, you're top ten player of the year. I think you were like sixth-ish coming in. And then, I mean, I haven't done the math on the points people have earned by making the semis. Still got it. <laughs> yeah, I think we could get behind this whole late career renaissance thing. <laughs> I, I know, I know kibler has been, 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 <laughs> been, been wanting a return to 2012 where he you know, won his second pro tour, and uh, he, he said he would not mind. I thought your mental faculties were supposed to decline with age. Is that not... I, I can't speak to any of that. <laughs> All I know is I, I played Eldrazi the last Pro Tour. It was a very good decision. <laughs> and I, I really liked our green-black tokens deck in the, at this Pro Tour. The that deck. deck was cool. It was yeah, a lot of fun to play. Super cool. At, at the very least. And, I, you know, I guess for that, I wouldn't mind seeing a tokens deck, uh, you know, take home the title. Well, Steve Rubin agrees with you as he takes a look at the opening hand that could take him to that title. Let's see what he's looking at here. It looks like a six-card hand. It is a six-card hand with an oath of Nyssa as well as two lands, so that's going to be a keeper. Looks like they're already both on I six I think they here? may both be on yeah. six cards. They are. They were both shuffling at the same time. Canopy Vista is going to hit the battlefield first. You know, I think we might see Lamholt Pacifist overform. Because it looked like that was, there was one in... 
Let's take a look. Does it, Manguchi if, have one in his hand? No, Steve does. If Steve, Steve plays a turn me? two lamb hold pacifist, oh, yeah. and then Manguchi didn't have a two drop, then Steve could have just just run him over. Just started running over but with he, a 4-4? Four four? He's casting Oath of Nissa just to guarantee that he can cast Nissa next turn. Interesting. Yeah, he didn't have the third land, right? Uh, it looked like he did. He just did, but he didn't have the double green. Is the, is, oh, he doesn't have the double green. He has, he's he had double for the second planes. green, yeah. The Oath gets him that. Okay, well, Manguchi would have foiled that plan here as he's found himself a Sylvan Advocate for turn two. Passes the turn back to Ruben. Does Ruben just play Nissa? Yeah, yes. I like Nissa make a plant because now Andrea can attack Nissa. You'll block with the plant, presumably. Or Andrea spends his turn casting Reflector Mage or Ground Crisis, in which case Nissa still survives and you still just get to use her next turn. Yeah. All right, Reflector Mage it is. Attack. Nissa falls down to two. And this is not the worst case scenario here for Ruben. No, Ruben's going to go like Lambold Pacifist, Threeben Inspector, make a plant. Wow. Another funny interaction, if Lampold Pacifist gets up to four power on its own, like with a Nissa plus plus one counter, for example, it can attack. <laughs> you can just attack oh on yeah. its own. Yep, it says it can only attack if you have a th four power creature in play. But it sees itself? It, yeah, it looks at itself. Okay. This is a great start for Steve Rubin. The pressure's on Andrea Mangucci to uh, keep this board stabilized, or else Rubin could be our champion. Green white tokens. And to reiterate, Nissa got cast due to Oath of Nissa. It's just, you know, when you see two planes and a canopy vista tap for Nissa, that is why. Mm -hmm. All right, here's Declaration in Stone. Going to take out the Lamholt Pacifist. I think that's a sign that it was a good card to sideboard in. And your opponent <laughs> yeah. sideboarded in removal, gets aimed at it. Good call. Now, a chump with the plant token means that Nissa still gets to survive this attack, falling back down to one. So good job by Mangucci to keep the heat on. Yeah, that was that was that was important. Oh. Was that an Avacyn off the That's top? That's an Avacyn. Yes. That was a huge draw. So wow. now, now Ruben can go make a plant land go. He has to worry about Ojutai's kin, but Andrea just has the the one Ojutai's kin. One. And if he doesn't have it, then then Steve can almost end the game with Avacyn just right on the spot. Mangucci does not have it. And he does not draw it for the turn either. He finds himself another copy yeah, of self an advocate. Sick feeling in your stomach if you're Mangucci and you just like Steve passes with five uh. mana. Could have secure, could have Avacyn. You could just not like is not, not attacking into a planeswalker, I think is what he's gonna do. Yeah, he's and just here we go. To attack. Yeah, that was that was that was a great play by Good, Mangucci. Great no attack, and here's an Archangel Avacyn. A Sylvan Advocate for Steve Rubin off the top. Steve's got some clues. I think he's going to start digging into them here. He could also cast Oath of Nyssa first, which I like because if it hits Gideon, that's just the perfect card here. Even hitting another Nyssa would be awesome because you could just minus Nyssa. Oh, he just game. hit Gideon right off the top. Jeez. We, we could be looking at a, a Pro Tour champion in a, just a couple turns here. Steve Rubin working his way towards the victory here. He's drawn some of his most powerful cards, Gideon, Avacyn, Nyssa. And he is building up the board state that could be the one that wins him the Pro Tour. Manguchi's got to win back-to-back -back games. He's only got one card left in his hand, and he just does not have the board state to contend with Ruben as of now. Yeah, so Ruben really, I think the card he has to worry about the most is Tragic Arrogance, because that, that's, okay. that's the kind of card that could turn this game around. Kind of like Emblem and Gideon is just my initial read on the situation, just because even with the Tragic Arrogance, that gives you this long-term advantage. And you're so far ahead on board here that you don't need another 2-2. Just guaranteeing that you get the emblem seems like it's pretty strong. Also means you don't lose a Planeswalker to Tragic Arrogance. <laughs> yeah, good point. He is currently losing a clue to Tragic Arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's going for it. He's going to make the emblem right now with Gideon. All of his creatures get plus one, plus one. He's going to make a plant token with Nyssa and probably set up a victory next turn if he can. And... He could actually attack with his for his first plant because if it dies, it, it's going to flip. It's going to flip out. Oh, Avacyn. nice. Okay, just Avacyn's going to attack for five. Drop Minguchi down to fifteen. Passes the turn back. It's an island off the top for Minguchi. He can't find what he needs. He finds a Nissa, which is a turn away from drawing cards. Is, is that too slow? You need to hit your seventh land. It's it's not guaranteed too slow. Andrea's probably not going to die next turn. 
Okay. But things just get worse and worse for every turn for here out, from here on out for Andrea. Because Steve's in a position where he can start using uh, Nissa or uh, Nissa to like minus. Also, if Andrea plays Nissa here, Steve knows Andrea doesn't have company or bounding crisis. And, and if Steve yeah. draws a land, he can just flip Ormondal. And win on the spot? No, you'd have to sacrifice Abyssin, so I guess that's not One, likely two, to happen. Three, four, Cause that would be he could yeah. make a plant, but that would be his fifth creature, so Right. Steve also has Oath of Nissa or uh, rather Sylvan Advocate in hand, hmm. so he he still just has another card he can play though. Andrea didn't play the Nissa. Yeah, I think he wanted to conceal information second Avacyn. Right. Second Avacyn off the top. That doesn't change anything right now, right? No, but it's a, still a really, really good draw because now if if Steve you know, keeps mana up for Avacyn, just lessens the chances he loses to Tragic Arrogance. So I think... So what happens if you, like... There's a bunch of four or five advocates. You could, again, just hit with Advocate. You could, like, minus Nissa, hit with Advocate... Or, sorry, uh, Avacyn. Leave mana up for Avacyn. If Tragic Arrogance gets cast, you get reduced to a plant. But Andrea gets reduced to just an Advocate, and then you ambush it with Avacyn when it attacks. It sounds very it's good to me. pretty tempting. Ruben's considering his options here. He does minus. Yeah, I like doing that. This is going to set up the win next turn. He just pump faked that he was going to tap two mana. Yeah, he did. I think that was a bluff. Yeah, I think he was so thinking he's about... He's never tapping any mana. He's I think not he going to play Sylvan Advocate here, right? No, he's no, not. I think he was thinking Here's about cracking it, it was a reflector uh, mage now for sure. Minaguchi. Does reflector mage buy him a turn here? <laughs> it's funny, you target Avacyn with Reflector Mage, and then <laughs> Ruben plays, he, he could plays play second Avacyn uh, response if he wants, because otherwise he wouldn't be able to play it this turn. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then keep the new Avacyn, but... Manguchi decides to play Nyssa. Trigger on the stack. He's going to go find a forest. Is this does allow him to transform Nissa. He is unable to cast Tragic Arrogance this turn, even if he right. finds it off Nissa, though. He's one mana short. Good thing for Steve, too. If, if Andrea doesn't play anything like that he has to respond to this turn, he just draws two cards off clues, and then even if a Tragic Arrogance happened, he has like Avacyn plus four other cards in hand, to, yeah. plus a Gideon Emblem sitting out there. So there's there's a lot going on here. And uh, if Andrea taps out too much, then Ormondal is going to come calling. He, he, you know, he, right. Steve, Andrea has to be aware of that. Steve's very aware of that. They're both sitting there, you know, wondering. There's a big one. It's in the gate. Yeah, he sideboarded in two in the gates for this game. No, I mean, they're good against Secure the Wastes and Planeswalkers, but yeah. not, not only are they not good in this situation, when your opponent knows you have negate, the, the utility just goes down so much. And here's the Reflector Mage to get rid of Avacyn. This does force Ruben to make a decision on either just letting this happen or casting his other Avacyn. So actually, I think well, Ruben, Ruben, just has the, right? Ruben just has the win here. Just With play, Ormondal. Yeah, play Avacyn, keep new Avacyn, untap, Nissa make a plant. Right, not he, enough Well, mana. he needs another land. He needs another land, so... Oh, he's a mana short. Yeah. So do you want to use your Avacyn for that? You can't play the second Avacyn if you let the ability resolve, is, is the problem. That's why you might have to lose an Avacyn. I still like just playing Avacyn here. Even if you don't win by drawing a land, you it kill makes Nissa or take half of Andrea's life total. Yeah, exactly. And you make all your creatures indestructible. So otherwise, because otherwise Andrea would have a good attack this turn that would threaten your Nissa. Yeah, good point. Steve Rubin's working through his options here. He can sense how close he is to that trophy. He's an untapped land away from just winning. Wow. And even if he doesn't try it, he's still in very, very good shape. Yeah. I mean, the other thing you can spend is mana on a sacking clues. Yeah. I'm Which with you, though. I like the Avacyn. I mean, if he doesn't do this play, he'll have two Avacyns in his hand, which is good later. But this game, yeah, this but game yeah, is not going to last that long, like where he needs the second Avacyn after having to wait a turn to play the first Avacyn. He's going for it. He's going to play the Avacyn. Now he's just an untapped land away from victory here. Can he find it? No, no, he finds his second Sylvan Advocate. He's going to crack a clue, draw his card, and he does find that <laughs> uh, land, of course, of with course, the yeah, mana down. He doesn't have enough. <laughs> Steve's got to be thinking like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> One draw step away there. 
This isn't still bad for him, though, yeah, right? Like you said, Randy, he's still Addison. attacking for five. Yeah. I, I like eating Nissa here, I think. It just gives Andrea one last draw step towards finding a, a card that can bring him back into the game. And, and with a plan of trying to win the game next turn anyway. Well, he, he probably won't go for Ormondal if Andrea has a bunch of untapped mana. So the game might last two turns, but... Yeah, exactly. Now well, let's get some more information first. What's the fun of clue first? He finds a Linvala, it looked like. Interesting. Well, that's one of the ways to get back into it. And the good thing about Tragic Arrogance from Steve's perspective is that even though it wipes his board, it's not, a, it's not painless for Andrea. Andrea does get reduced to a single Sylvan Advocate. Okay. So He it's went for Andrea's life total. He did. He's yeah. going to try to get him. It was... Ojutai's command. Ojutai's command for Andre and Maguchi. Does that actually change the clock here? Gains him some life. So, yes. Okay, draw step incoming here from Manguchi. Finds a Sylvan Advocate. He still has a Jace, though. He still has one more shot to try to hit that tragic arrogance. He can also plus Nissa first, and if he hits a Castable Spell or an Evolving Wilds, he goes up to four cards in his graveyard, then he can flip Jace and uh, Declaration of Stone, the Avacyn. We're all talking about things that don't beat Ormondal, but Andrea might be Untapped able to... Untapped mana might delay yeah. Ormondal. Yeah, exactly. He can stave it off by... Oh, no, yeah, he's looking at Jace. He's like, do I want a Jace first? Flipping Jace for... There's declaration a dec of stone sounds declaration great. Declaration in stone as yeah, well. Yeah, I think you Nissa first. Yeah, well, you do need to do something first if you want to flip Jace, because there's only three cards in the graveyard. Right. Hmm. Look like a bounding crisis. It is. It's a bounding crisis. Yep. Yeah. If Steve Rubin would have attacked Nissa last turn, then it would allow actually Jace to transform on Manguchi's turn. Oh, that's a good point. That's actually a good reason to attack Andrea instead of Nissa. Yeah. Andrea's looking at the board state. He's, he's not, trying he's to not, find a way out. He's not dead next turn. He, 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 you know, he, he survived the turn of the untapped land, Spelling Doom, because he has Bounding Crisis to tap down Ormondal. Or Avacyn. Or Avacyn. The, actually, the problem is he has to go Bounding Crisis, tap Avacyn, and then Steve can just Ormondal. Right. And you know the fact that Steve can Ormondal while leaving Avacyn in play this turn is not all in? Actually, it makes me really want to do that. Just plus Nyssa, and then just Ormondal with your other creatures. Yep. And then, hmm. oh look, or Steve can just, wow, okay. I guess with a Gideon Emblem out, now he can just attack Make with a whole creatures. bunch of lethal creatures here. He's going to minus Nissa to put a plus one, plus one counter on each, each of his creatures. He still has Archangel Avacyn. One of the things I really like about using uh, Westville Abbey this turn is, let's say you go to your attack. Andrea's going to abandon Crisis the, the, the Avacyn. You can then Westvale Abbey away the three plants, the Thraven Inspector, and the Sylvan Advocate. Then Andrea has to have a second Bound in Crisis or a Reflect Mage off Collected Company in order to not die to Ormondal. Wow. Yeah, you're really forcing him to have very specific Even if those things, things happen, Avacyn then flips on Andrea's upkeep. <laughs> and wipes his board. Killing the two Reflector Mages. Doesn't kill Jace because Jace gets to flip uh, in response. Jace and doesn't be. kill the Advocates. So hmm. it's not, you know, everything is not great. But you also force Andrea to have two answers for your two Flyers. Steve Rubin's lining up his attack here. He's up two games to one here in the finals of the Pro Tour. And it looks like he's going to attack with everything here. So that means that... He didn't play the Manguchi did not crisis here. He does have Odertai's command, so he does not just die to go the to Avacyn. eight. And the Avacyn deals six by herself. So is that Andrea realizing that if he does do the Bounding Crisis, then he dies to Ormondal? I think so. So therefore he so. saves the Crisis? I think so, but that, that might be operating... That might be... Yeah, that, that's the safest play for sure. This is the best way for Andrea to survive this turn. Problem is he, he then is not getting as much value out of his Crisis. Though he can right. untap his Jace and then block and then tap Jace to, to loot and flip it so he doesn't die. That does give him access to Declaration in Stone hmm. on his turn. 
All right. Yeah. And this Andrea is still wants, hanging around as well. He's not using the crisis on Avison because because he can gain the life of Fudgetize Command, he can afford to use the crisis on Jace. So Steve has a five six Sylvan Advocate. So if Andrea wants to kill it, he has to double block it. Or six seven rather. And he still has to block everything, right? If he's, he's gaining life, six. he still has to block everything. Yeah. Yes. Which means... Avacyn is six? Yeah. It means, yeah, it means a lot of chump blocks here. Also, Andrea can block such that he doesn't kill any of Steve's creatures. But if he does kill them, then Avacyn is going to flip on his next turn. He has and do to three block to so he doesn't kill anything, off. right? Because he's taking... Yeah. Otherwise, he takes six, he's going down to two, because he's at effective yeah. eight right now. And then the three kills him. Yeah, he can't kill a creature. He Which has to block them all without killing any of them. Which means Andrea is basically just jump blocking five the creatures. The whole team here. Not, that's not a good sentence to, to, to hear when you're talking about winning a game. Right. I mean, he can survive the turn, we think. But yeah, Krasis on... I don't know. If he, if he had summoned Bounding Krasis and tapped Avacyn, I don't know if Steve goes for Ormondal. It would have worked, but... And Andrea knows he was vulnerable to that, which is why he's gone this line, I think. Yeah. That's always tough, though, because Andrea right, knows right. he's dead if he does it. Right, but he's got but four how, scary untapped lands from Steve's perspective. How conservative would Steve be in a game that he's, like, pretty heavily favored in right. if nothing really impactful happens? Super cool game. This yeah, has been fun. This has been an These amazing games are just, game. Very hard to play. Incredibly complex as well. Okay, so before damage, oh, so Jace... He did double block, by the way, a plant token. Hmm. Assuming Avazin flips here, which it looks like it should. Yeah, Steve. He's going to hit Andrea to two, because Andrea is going to have to cast Energize Command. Right, he's going to gain four. Presumably draw a card here. Could Andrea be setting up a counterattack? If he gets back a Sylvan Advocate, he ends up with three Sylvan Advocates that can attack for 12. But I guess there's an untapped Avacyn and a Westvale at base, yeah, so. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, three, 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 so. Yeah, they forgot to order the blockers. Yeah, That's what they were going back to do. So Mangucci up to eight life, taking six in the air. I, I have to draw a card. Okay. Is resolved, no? Yep. Finds a tireless tracker or a dusk maybe recruiter. a dusk watch recruiter. Right, sure. So damage is going to happen here. Uh, yeah. 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 I don't think he can win, and Steve Rubin takes the tournament down. He is your <laughs> champion here at Pro Tour Shadows Over Innistrad. Congratulations <laughs> to Rubin. He worked his way through an incredibly complex c uh, scenario there and found himself the victor. Also, congratulations to Mangucci on the awesome. Finals I just want to say that Pro Tour Shadows of Innistrad ended the only way it possibly could. Avis in the Purifier flip trigger. Yes. That, is, that was the last game action that was going to happen. <laughs> that is That's it. amazing. Wow, congratulations to our champion, Steve Rubin. I can tell you, he, he's a lot happier than he looks right there in, <laughs> in that picture. He's a pretty chill guy, and, uh, you know, he doesn't want to overdo it in front of his friend, uh, Andrea Mangucci, but he's thrilled to have won the Pro Tour. So fantastic stuff. And wow, I, I got to say, that last game, super intense, the game before oh, yeah. it was the up and down game <laughs> where they were just like, I'm ahead, I'm ahead, I'm ahead. This game was just a downhill battle for Steve, but it was a complicated, well-fought one. Yes, it was really, I mean, he got you to pause for like a few <laughs> seconds, which right there, I already yeah, know. It was, it, 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 I think it was w w really well played on both sides that final game. It was a really yeah. tough game to navigate. Right, and you could tell that both players were in the tank quite a bit as well. All right, well, we have our champion. Let's send it to Rich at the news desk. Thanks very much to Marshall Sutcliffe, Louis Scott Vargas, and Randy Bueller there with a call on an epic four-game final here at Pro Tour Shadows over in Estrad. Brian David Marshall, when we came in, we thought this was going to be one of the best top eights that had ever been assembled. There were seven champions coming in. How many do we have now? Now we have eight. Steve Rubin was the only person he, who came into this top eight without some sort of trophy. Uh, he. You know, he was he had a tr tremendous year last year. He put up great results. He got himself locked into playing on the Pro Tour for, you know, this whole season. Mm -hmm. But a win eluded him. 
a top eight eluded him. This was even the first top eight of his Pro Tour career. So just a tremendous result for Steve Rubin. Another great finish for face-to-face -face games. He's a new member of that team and a great finish for this green-white token stack, Ian. Yeah, the, the deck was phenomenal. You know, Steve played incredibly. Hats off to face-to-face -to -face games for coming up with such an innovative deck that really just you know, hit that, that Bant Company deck exactly how it needed to, and was the, really the, the breakout deck of the tournament as far as performance in the Swiss. Yeah, so the Bant Company decks, 87 of them came in at day one, around about just over 20% of the field. We saw them whittled away and whittled away, and by the time we started today, there was just one of them left in the hands of Andrea Mengucci. He got almost all the way there, but not quite. quite. And Ian, the, the guys on commentary were just saying, even though Ruben was ahead, throughout that fourth game, and indeed, to be fair, throughout the match, to actually get over the line was so tough in that game four. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just a back and forth struggle. It really shows how tenacious the band company deck can be. It's hard to grind through all that card advantage, but I mean, Archangel Avison performed incredibly all throughout yeah. the match. Power, power of that card really showcased, uh, you know, so many decisions throughout the tournament mm -hmm. about, you know, when to play Avison, what do you do to trigger Avison, how do you trigger your opponent's Avison, is my opponent leaving up untapped mana for a counterspell, for an Avison, for a secure the waste, just an incredibly exciting dynamic card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was absolutely at the heart of, of this meta game, uh, both in limited and constructed, and I want to turn attention for a minute or two to limited. The players are getting ready for the award ceremony right now. You'll get that live, of course, as soon as the players are ready for that. Trophies checks are plenty, and then we'll have the winner right here as well. Um, Ian, from R&D's perspective, how did the limited format shape up? It feels like we're in the middle week of three. We had last weekend uh, three Grand Prix around the world, and I think things kind of shifted between last week and this. Yeah, we've almost seen a sort of a metagame develop with the limited format, which is, is highly unusual. Mm. Uh, I think earlier on, people were sort of trying to get their feet grounded and figure out all these synergy-based archetypes in the format. It is very synergy-based, but um, you know, starting with, with the, the Grand Prix, I think people really realize the value of the, the aggressive decks and these aggressive cards like Rush of Adrenaline, and that definitely shifted the metagame a lot in terms of now, now if you want to build a slower and more controlling deck, you need to be prepared for these aggressive starts. Uh, one of our top eight competitors, Seth Manfield, I talked to him about this limited format, and he's like, there's nothing else I want to be doing in this format than <laughs> casting Rise from the Tides. You know, he, you know, a lot of people have moved away from these sweet decks, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, this is a cool deck. It does all this stuff. But Seth Manfield's like, no, this is what I want to do. I want to cast spells. I want to bounce things. I want to tempo you. And then, you know, like, you know, where you're constantly replaying your cards. And then I'm going to cast Rise from the Tides. I'm going to make 12 zombies. I'm only playing six to eight creatures in my deck. And I'm just going to kill you with these zombies. As long as this isn't the last card in my deck, that's how I'm going to win. Yeah, and I think the dust is far from settled as far yeah, as far yeah. as you know the verdict is still out on what types of decks will turn out to be the best right and i mean we, we played six rounds of limited we've played now 13 full rounds of constructed so we, we have sort of seen more of the 60 card side but I, I, know I, know, how much... I know less about what i want to play in standard than what i want to <laughs> okay. play in the limit there were eight different sweet decks i mean even you know even if we want to you know sort of paint the public enemy number one picture on bad company that deck is sweet that's exactly the kind of deck i want to play if i if i get into the Pro Tour uh, Gauntlet on Magic Online, mm -hmm. and I get the Bant Company deck, I'm going to be super happy. That deck is awesome. It does everything I want to do in a game of Magic, but so does Seasons Past Control. Oh, yeah. well, so does Black Green Aristocrats. <laughs> well, I tell you what, why don't we put the bracket up for you and just look at the eight decks that we came into today with, because it really is something for everyone, and this diversity and this... I mean, there's almost nothing there that you would look at and go... Okay, well, it made the top eight, but I don't really think that's a deck moving forward. Let's let's just work down them. Seasons Pass Control. Um, Ian, I know that's one of your favorite decks from the tournament. Yeah, this was uh, Channel Fireball Pantheon's deck. John Finkel played it to immense success. Reed Duke and Huey Jensen also worked on it. It's it's sort of a black base control deck. You've got Dark Petition to find all these spicy one ofs. You can really tune it and tweak it, you know, to your expected metagame. I think there's a lot of play to the deck, and I definitely want to try it out. So next week, when we go to Grand Prix Toronto, we'll have live video coverage from there every round, of course, for you as we head through that. It'll be interesting to see what seasons past control looks like. There are going to be a lot of people not named John Finkel playing that deck at Grand Prix Toronto. BDM, Bank Company was next, that's Andrea Mengucci's deck. Um, the one that everyone knew about coming in, the only last one left standing got as far as the final. People came in expecting to beat it, in the end, that's what Steve Rubin needed to do. <laughs> right. 
Is that a deck that you would be sleeving up for standard in a few days from now? You know what, if I... Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'd be certainly, you know, it's not the, the you know, I, I would probably sleeve up Seasons Pass Control if I was going to have fun. But if mm -hmm. I, I think if I wanted to win, I think if I wanted to do really well, I might play, I might play Bit. Uh, bad company that's just a deck that has a lot of game against a lot of different decks yeah it's definitely a rock solid deck it was the most popular deck at this tournament it wasn't the best performing deck at the tournament but i think a lot of that had to do with the fact that it was public enemy number one coming in so it's definitely beatable but it's still definitely an awesome deck yeah that's just two of the eight decks you've also got uh black green aristocrats luis scott vargas and again ian uh, not something that was really uh, expected coming in yeah this was an innovative deck as well sort of reminiscent of the rally decks from from last uh, season, but plays out a little bit differently. Gets to use some of the new cards like Westvale Abbey and Cryptolithrite. Cryptolithrite and, was an unexpected card. Yeah, for and a lot definitely of an, another deck that is excellent at taking down banned companies. So if you're playing against a lot of that in your local metagame, definitely check out that Black Green Aristocrats deck. Yeah, and BDM, something that Ian said there about reminiscent of Rally. The deck building fingerprints all over that yeah. deck as well. Matt, Matt Nass uh, mm -hmm. built Rally. You know, we joked with Louis Scott Vargas that, you know, he could spend his winnings to buy a time machine to go back to Pro Tour <laughs> Battle for Zendikar and play Matt Nass's Rally deck. And he's like, yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Yeah, I think so. All right, great stuff. Well, I can tell you, they're ready down for us. It is time for the award ceremony here at Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad. Hello and welcome to the feature match area here at Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad. It has been a long and awesome weekend for our players and now it's time for the most fun part. We get to give away some trophies. We have two players to recognize here. The first, our finalist from Italy, Andrea Mengucci. job, Andrea. And now, let's recognize our champion from the United States, Steve Rubin. <laughs> Steve, huge congratulations. What a big moment for you. Talk us through your team members, the people that help you get here. All right, the, for this Pro Tour, for the first time, I team with team face-to-face -face games. Um, uh, my strategy in playing for Magic is just kind of uh, have fun, and whatever I get extra, I get. And Oh, here they are. I got it with face-to-face, -face, so I, I'm quite happy. <laughs> How do you guys feel about his victory? <laughs> Dece. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your champion, Steve Rubin. legs were broken during the making of that award ceremony. Congratulations to Steve Rubin. He'll be here in just a minute. So, Ian, we were talking about the constructed decks, um, and we've looked at Seasons Pass. We've looked at Bank Company. We've looked at Black Green Aristocrats. Where do you see Esper Dragons moving forward? Shoda Yasuoka, I think a lot of us behind the scenes would have said pretty much he was always going to be on a deck like that. But what about for the rest of us going to Friday Night Magic this week, loading it up on Magic Online? Where do you see Esper Dragons? Well, I think the tales of Esper Dragons' demise have been much exaggerated clearly here as Shota has shown. I think, you know, coming into the tournament the first couple of weeks of Standard, people were like, you just can't play this deck anymore without dig through time. But uh, if you take a look at Shota's list, it looks like he put a ton of effort into tuning the mana base, into getting it lower to the ground, having a lot of early interaction, cards like Clash of Wills, Silumgar's Scorn, Grasp of Darkness, cheap removal spells. And I was really impressed with, you know, Maybe, maybe I, for sure, Shota is a master, but I think the deck, you know, definitely can stand on its own as well. So mm -hmm. check it out. 
so next up we had Brad Nelson. Now, he was playing Red Green Goggles Ramp, and if people had been working Friday, Saturday, and just turned up, watched Nelson against Rubin, he lost 3-0, they'd have gone, so what's all this Red Green Goggles Ramp about then? But there's a lot to it, and it, it seems like a terrific deck. Yeah, Red Green Ramp is an archetype that's been around for, for many months now, but adding Pyromancer's Goggles to it, I mean, it, World Breaker and Pyromancer's Goggles next to each other seems totally incongruous. <laughs> it does. But it was an awesome solution to the metagame here this weekend. And seeing car, you know, things like Fall of Titans for X equals eight get doubled. I mean, it just explosive, explosive thing. And um, also copying Magmatic Insight and Tormenting Voice were really like the key tools that allowed this ramp deck to keep the card flow going in order to pr propel it into the late game. One of the things that Magic's so great at is finding decks for different types of people. And it's fair to say that I'm a control player, so I look at Esper Dragons, but I also look at Seth Manfield's Esper Control, and I'm probably gonna want to choose between those two. Do you have a sense which of those two is perhaps better position? Maybe the has got the most room to grow in this growing standard format. I think they both have room to grow in different directions. I think it really just depends on, like you said, Rich, what your style is as a player. We likened Seth Manfield's deck to a Boa Constrictor earlier, and I think it's kind of apt because, you know, you, you watch that deck play out, and once it starts to get a little bit of traction and starts resolving these high loyalty Planeswalkers, it's very difficult for the opponent to get out of that stranglehold as those planeswalkers just keep ticking up and up and generating incremental value. On the other hand, Shota's deck is capable of winning the game very quickly with cards like Dragonlord Ojutai and Dragonlord Silumgar. So yeah, just depends on which way you want to go. Now, I really don't have it in for the Goggles deck, <laughs> but it is true that the other Goggles deck, Luis Salvato from Argentina with the red, white Eldrazi Goggles, that also lost 3-0 in the quarterfinals and wasn't a great showcase for what does seem like a very good deck. It's true, it wasn't a great showcase, but obviously, you know, Luis did very, very well throughout the Swiss, and, you know, the deck seems a little bit eclectic, but it's got a lot of play to it. You get to play with powerful cards like Thought Not Seer, you know, no one doubts the power of that card, and also, next to Pyromancer's Goggles, with plenty of red burn spells and powerful instants and sorceries. Uh, and what struck me most about that deck is if you take a look at the list, there's lots of twos and threes and four ofs um, at varying numbers there, and so it strikes me as a deck that has a lot of play, that you can tune to your local metagame, and that as the overall standard metagame evolves, you can kind of just take that deck whatever direction makes the most sense. So Seasons Past, Bant Company, Black Green Aristocrats, Esper Dragons, Red Green Goggles Ramp, Esper Control, Red White Eldrazi Goggles, none of them won because the winner was Green White Tokens and the winner was this man, Steve Rubin. Thanks, Rich. I'm here with Pro Tour Shatters over Innistrad Champion. Yep. First time in the top eight, Steve Rubin. Sure, yeah. Uh, you, you had a tremendous season last year. You called yourself the pro. Nobody quite knew you. You were, you were a little sure, under the yeah, radar. Of course. Uh, what, what did it feel like to make the top eight? And what expectations did you have going into that stacked um, bracket? It felt good. I mean, there was certainly some great players in this top eight. So I, I, I don't know what, exactly what I expected. I, I just wanted to play it out, see what happened. I, I thought that uh, my deck was well positioned. And I guess it turned out to be so. So everything went well, I suppose. Um, we, we're going to pour out a little ever-flowing chalice for Team Blitz here. Three sure. of your teammates in the top eight from, the, from, your, from your previous team. Yeah. Uh, you guys all worked together for the World Championship last year. Sure. Uh, Talk, talk about the change of scenery going to team face-to-face -face games okay. and how you guys came up with this green-white uh, tokens deck. Um, well, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, obviously, we started uh, a bit early, about a week before Barcelona, uh, the Grand Prix last week. And uh, we just started, normally for the first week, we, we, they just did limited. I, I'm not, uh, it's actually new to me. Usually I do a mix the entire time, but we did limited up to the Grand Prix, and then we, we started testing constructed series. So, you know, some games here and there in between. Um, but we came up with a green-white deck actually quite late, about uh, Tuesday this week, I think, wow. or Monday, because we were just... Uh, Bant, and, Bant and humans seem to be the big decks, you know, and it seemed like they just seemed to beat everything. And we had, we had thrown everything at them, and it was almost impossible to make a deck that beat both. You know, you could beat one, but not the other. Um, Brian Brandoon actually towards the end, like this was the last day that we had devoted to maybe trying something else, said, how about this green white token deck that he's seen from a tournament in the Star City Games Invitational. Uh, we changed a few cards and it immediately just started beating those decks and moving from there. And uh, that's pretty much how it came to be. And so you get to the finals and that's got to almost feel like so perfect. You're talking about beating Bad Company and sure. then you get to play against Bad Company in the finals. Yeah. What, what, tell us a, a little bit about some of the highs and lows of, of that final match. Okay, well, I mean, I, I started off strong. You know, the, the pre-board games I think are pretty good. Um, I was able to uh, 
use Avacyn, obviously, to sweep his board and, and win some of the early games. It's harder to do that post-board. Um, game, game three, I really flubbed. You know, it, it was a difficult situation. I, I, I messed up a few times, maybe, maybe more than a few times, but I just had to keep my head straight for game four. You know, if you make a mistake, you're, you still have two more games. You can't let it hurt you. You can't uh, be upset about it. So I just pressed on and uh, was able to win a really, really close game four, I think. I, I think that's a super important skill. We, we've, I've seen that, you know, countless Pro Tour victories sure. where somewhere along the way someone made a mistake that I think at a lower level of play might yeah. completely derail your, your match. How, how, does, how does someone learn to be able to uh, course adjust like that? Well, well, the first thing is to realize that nobody's perfect. I mean, I, I, I certainly did not play this tournament perfectly or the finals or anything for that matter. Um, but, you know, understand that the, ga the game is going to continue on and then there's no... It's, it's almost expected, you know. I, I have a thing for every Pro Tour where once per day I, I allow myself... It sounds kind of silly, but I allow myself one big mistake. It, like, I mean, it's just going to happen. I'm not the best technical player, but, you know, I, I can play with the best of them. And sometimes you make a mistake. If you know it's going to happen eventually, you know, I'm going to make a mistake. Um, as long as you have the mentality of, well, I need to keep going, then it's, it's not so bad. So at least that's how I think about it. But um, it, I guess it worked out for me here. That's a great, that's a great attitude. Not so bad indeed. $40,000, sure. a giant cup, yeah. invitation to the World Championship. Of course. We'll see you in Sydney. We'll see you at the World Championship. Steve Rubin, congratulations on an amazing, it's hard to say breakthrough finish after last year, sure. but, you know, a breakthrough top eight right. performance. Sincerely, thank you, man. I appreciate it. That was just fantastic. You learn so much in just those couple of minutes. Most of all about forgiving yourself for the error, because errors happen all the time in Magic. Yeah, I really liked what Steve had to say there about allowing oneself a mistake, but then accepting that and being able to move past it. That's just a huge, huge skill and great self-awareness. Um, you know, really, really important thing in, in Magic tournaments. In an amazing weekend is coming to a close. What's the one thing you'll take away from Pro Tour Shadows over in Estrad? Uh, I don't know. The formats look awesome. I want to go play Magic, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I want to go play Magic. There's certainly nothing wrong with that as a way to close. We hope you've had a fantastic three days here on behalf of everyone at Wizards of the Coast. The technical team behind the scenes, all the people who bring you the best game in the world, our players who are the best on Earth. We thank you for the viewing that you've given us over the last three days. Let's do it all again really soon. Join us for Grand Prix Toronto next weekend. But until we do meet again, from everyone here, on the Pro Tour. I'm your host, Rich Hagen, saying bye.